in about 20, 28 years of doing these gatherings, it's the first time we've had a coyote appear. I, I didn't see the coyote, but I could look and see the faces of everybody looking. And so Francis just looked up the coyote as a symbol. The coyote symbolism signifies the answers to your problems that often come in ways and forms you least expect. And here we are, out here, and we had a coyote show up. And then it also goes on to say, your coyote totem will teach you to strike a balance between playfulness and wisdom. Put those two together, playfulness and wisdom. So that was a pretty strong symbol to have the coyote come peek in at the very beginning of our gathering. In Native American teaching, coyote is the trickster, right? Yeah, it is. Okay. Well, we didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah. I did a whole talk in Ireland one time on exposing the clever one. That was the title. Because the ego is out of awareness, and that's why it's, it's so um, deceptive to our Christ nature. It covers over our divinity with all kinds of schemes and lies, and you might look at this world, it's like multiplication of images, trying to get us all caught up in the images and forget who we truly are, the essence of our being. That's the I am presence prior to time. It cannot be found inside of time. You have to go to the before Abraham was I am. Presence of the Christ, the I amness before time was. And this morning I was praying too, it was like it was again a reminder of the holographic universe, like the the whole is contained in every one of the parts, just like in a hologram, but but you have to let go of everything you think you know about the parts in order to recognize the holistic nature. So you could find your presence in a blade of grass if you withdrew all your ideas of color, shape, texture, size, history, uh, everything that you know. Jesus says that in A, in a Course in Miracles workbook. You could receive the vision of Christ from a table if you withdrew everything you ever learned about that table. So that's why we're talking about it's prior to time. And staying with Miriam, a family therapist, we were having a wonderful discussion this morning because she was as we were talking a little bit about bipolar diagnosis and different kind of things and Again, the Spirit came into me and reminded me that, that this whole world is, is schizophrenic, the whole world is psychotic, and the whole world has a bad case of multiple personality disorder. And some of you read the book Sybil, and, and all these altars that were the different personalities. This world has seven billion altars. Seven billion hallucinations, seven billion fragments that believe that they exist as people in and of themselves. They believe that they exist with a mind of their own. They believe that they exist with their own thoughts, just like in multiple personality cases, where the alters seem to all share one mind. Yeah, we all share one mind, except the mind that believes in these alters is, is deceived into its identity. It's forgotten the whole and now it's all cut up in its little particular part called a personality. Why is it psychotic? Because psychosis is a break from reality and our spiritual nature, our divinity, our eternity is our true nature. So the human condition is therefore psychotic. It's a, it's a break from Reality. Why is it schizophrenic? I just want to add to that that yeah. it's a break from the ego's reality, not from yeah. the spirit's reality. Well, well, I'm saying the whole human condition has a psychotic, has had a psychotic break. 
And then schizophrenia is when you hear multiple voices. Well, when you talk to your brothers and your sisters, these voices of the seven billion are the voices of the schizophrenia. So, so we have multiple personality, psychosis, and schizophrenia going on. And forgiveness is the simple answer to the problem of the, of the mental illness, because it is a mental illness. Just like in, yesterday we were talking about quantum physics, and the quantum realm seems to have no relation to what human beings talk about in the perceptual world, because the quantum realm, the quantum field is completely connected. And everything that's perceived through the ego's filter is disunited, disconnected. And we were talking at the breakfast this morning about how frustrating and sad it is to keep trying to correct the problems in the, in the individual realm of the human being or in the interpersonal realm. So it's almost like our gaze is sm focused too small. We're, we're focusing on the tiny, tiny, tiny stuff of, of the human individual and human relationships. And the correction is way, way back. It's like the cor correction is this beautiful presence. Welcome. Good morning. So, if we just begin to start to realize that we have to come much, much farther back in awareness. We have to come way back to the dreamer of the dream perspective of this world. The reason we have to come back to the dreamer is because the dreamer can change the purpose of the world. The dream figures can't. They're part of the dream. Asking asking the dream figures to change the world is like going to a tree and having a leaf fall off that tree and going up to the leaf and saying, why don't you change? <laughs> and the leaf's like, come on, I'm just a leaf. You know, it's when we expect a personal savior, even a personal savior like Jesus or Buddha or an avatar, we're still looking to the part. But we need to go beyond the part to the essence of what is behind that part the essence of love, the essence of our true nature. And what Francis and I really want to talk about today is anybody who's ever studied philosophy, quantum, even starts to get a glimpse of how huge this correction is. The question that arises always is how do I go from this tiny little personal perspective on the world to the vast perspective of forgiveness that realizes everything is working together for good, that there are no mistakes, that everything's in perfect divine order and always has been in perfect divine order. And the one answer, it, it's very evident in the movie last night, and, and if you ask me how the last 30 years of my life have, has gone, the practical answer that we can talk about is guidance. Everyone has that divine guidance. Everyone has equal access to the Spirit. There can be layers of blocks and resistances there, and it can be a huge resistance. In, in the movie last night, you saw that acted out with Soren. <laughs> you know, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. And then Netta, his singing partner, says, especially God. <laughs> And he goes, right. <laughs> That's what the Course calls the authority problem. It's like, no, I, I can make my own identity, thank you very much. I don't need to be shown what my identity is. It's like the ego is the attempt to make an identity that is not true. To make a small identity, a small self, to take the place of the capital, one self. And so that's why all awakening is nothing more than the undoing of the self-concept, we call it. And I think Emily brought that word into the movie last night with Frances Romero. She has a strong cook, or kitchen cooking self-concept. Her worth was very much tied into cooking for other people. And then 
she also had a bit of denial. I'm happy. I don't see any of that. You know, you know how it, denial can be glazing over, and then the tears come later when when the crack in the armor, <laughs> the denial armor, comes. But the, the deep thing about this is that the the self concept is not just your personality self. It's the personality self and the context in which the personality self seems to exist. So all of time and space are part of the self-concept. You're not just trying to let go of a personality, you have to let go of the whole construct of what the personality seems to exist in. So the sun, the moon, the stars, everything of time and space is the self-concept. And that's why there is no escaping personally. People have said to me, well, if Jesus escaped 2,000 years ago, why am I still here? I thought he would have handled it for the rest of us <laughs> if, he, if he escaped into realization who he was. And, and in one sense Jesus says, when I awoke you were with me. So this dream is a dream that's already over, it's already gone, it's already been healed. It was actually healed the instant it seemed to arise, but the acceptance of that correction can seem to take as long as it takes until the mind can voluntarily accept the correction. Why would, if you're the Christ, why would you need to be coerced into waking up? If you're the Christ, why would you need to be lured into waking up? It must be that it's more natural to be who you really are than to try to pretend to be something that you're not. And therefore we've relied on learning and we've learned this world and therefore we have to unlearn the world. But it can only come where there is no fear. We, if we try to do it too fast, if we try to force ourselves away. Good morning. Welcome. If we try to push the envelope, if we try to push anything, then the fear arises. Imagine a scenario where there was a, a child in its bedroom, sleeping and dreaming and having a nightmare. And if you went in as a parent and tried to wake that child up during the nightmare, if you started like nudging or shaking the child while the child was in the middle of the nightmare, you are apt to be perceived as part of the nightmare, like a monster. You may have a gentle nudge to, to push the child, but if the child is in the middle of a nightmare, that, that, could be, that nudge can be perceived as the jaws of the dragon from inside the nightmare. And that's why we have A Course in Miracles because we need to have miraculous experiences. We need to start to realize ever so slowly that we want the peace and happiness and joy of heaven more than the dream world. When the mind made up, the ego made this dream world up, when the mind fell asleep it started to become accustomed to the dream world and it adapted and adjusted to the lie. And now it perceives the awakening with fear because it's like, I like this dream. <laughs> it's not all bad. Well, maybe it's not all bad, but it's, it's not at all real either. But as long as we break the dream into good parts and bad parts, then that reinforces the reality of the dream. Even the most common things that human beings believe they can tell the difference between. And Jesus comes along in His Course in Miracles and Jesus says, you're so asleep and you're so deceived that you cannot, in your current condition of sleeping and dreaming, you can't tell the difference between pain and joy. And that seems pretty strong. Like, Am I that deceived that I can't tell the difference between pain and joy? And he says, that's correct. If you could tell the difference between pain and joy, 
the pain would be gone forever. If you truly knew joy, joy that has no opposite, joy that is your reality, joy that is your birthright, joy that is your inheritance, you could not experience pain at all. So you cannot tell the difference between pain and joy. So what the movie is doing and what we're talking about with these deep teachings is how to come to a discernment between your right mind, between the intuitive voice of the spirit and between the ego. Because, because true joy would have no opposite, and true love has no opposite. Whereas when we experience something like um, romantic love, or we experience something like, like a joy that comes from getting something that we believe we want. You know, like a child, if you take a child into a, an ice cream store, you know, Baskin Robbins or Dairy Queen or something like that, Ben and Jerry's, and then the, you take the child back and the child's like looking at all the flavors and then when the, the double dip chocolate with Jimmy's and everything is delivered, then the child's like has a sense of glee. But that's, that's a temporary glee. That, that's not spiritual No, joy. that's not spiritual joy. So it's what you're saying. It's not really true joy. since we have all been uh, shamed into not expressing our feelings, we can't feel joy, we can't feel fear, we can't feel, we can emote, and a lot of people will emote like they will cry, but they're not getting to the source of it to really release that out. So when you shut that down, you're shutting it all down. So you can't feel that until you open up that dam of being able to release. And then I was able to really feel it all once I let that, horror start to come out and get back to that connection of source. Yeah, yes. Also, we, we do ask that we'll, we will pass the microphone around because we are, even though we're a small intimate group here, we are recording this for the whole universe. And actually the channel I will put it up on has like 26 and a half million plays. <laughs> uh, and people in countries all over the world would love to hear your questions and would love to hear your beautiful expressions because that helps save time for everyone. When you have a miracle to share, when you have a profound question to share, someone in Ethiopia or someone in China or somewhere could hear this and go, oh my gosh, I never thought of that. So with the question of emotions, what A Course in Miracles does, and I, I totally agree with what you shared and, and I'm very grateful for that because, because as long as we try to shut down any emotions, judging them as negative or I shouldn't feel this and the typical self-concept things, that gets us into a state of denial, of repression. It, it, it's a lockdown in the mind and there is no way that healing occurs through denial, repression, and, and blocking off anything. In other words, revelation is totally revealing the light. And the only way we come to that is through giving ourselves permission to get in touch with whatever we're feeling without judging it in a positive or negative way. And then Jesus takes us in the Course where He just basically says, Ultimately, you have but two emotions, love and fear. We know there's a lot of derivatives. The joy would be a derivative of the love. The, the glee, the happiness is a derivative of love. Shame, you mentioned. Guilt, uh, anger. anger, envy, jealousy. You know, there's a range of ones that he's basically saying it's love and fear. And he puts it in a time context where he says, that the time of terror, the tiny tick of time that was a time of terror, 
he calls the unholy instant. In biblical terms, that's the fall from grace. Not that there was a real fall, but in awareness, there was a perceived, believed fall. Not that you can really separate from your Creator, but so the fall from grace or the shadow that Carl Jung talked about and the unconscious mind, all of that is what Jesus is saying is, is actually took place in one instant and that instant was answered immediately. So, so really the correction to the error is not a matter of linear times. You don't have to think how many thousands of years is it going to take me, how many reincarnations, how many incarnations is it going to take me to accept my perfect, divine, innocent nature. He's basically saying it's, it comes down to how willing are you to go into the, the, the instant, the holy instant, the instant of your innocence. How strong is your desire? How strong is your prayer to know who you really are? Because it's not a matter of time, it's more a matter of desire. I think people who have been through 12 steps can realize that too. You know, you know that it's not really a matter of time. <coughs> How willing am I to do the steps? How willing am I to, to do the inventories? How willing am I to, to drop the mask with my sponsor, you know, to be authentic? To be totally revealing, to not hide anything, to not protect anything. There's a power in there, it's the higher power, but it's activating when we're desiring that correction. So, as you could see from the movie last night, that those, the people who came there, all the participants and all the film crew, um, basically Francis asked everybody from the very beginning, you know, what is the prayer of your heart? And then you start talking about the C word, not cancer, commitment. <laughs> the C word. In our circles, whatever anyone says, oh, the C word, we don't even think cancer, we think commitment. How committed am I? Because, when, because once we start to commit, you know, ultimately we're committing to, to the goal of awakening, the goal of everlasting happiness and joy, and we're committing to an experience. Our heart is completely open. We, you know, we can <clears throat> give and receive. This is the end goal we're committing. But we cannot reach the end goal unless we're accepting the means. So what we realized was a lot of the people, when we say we, we, we want the end goal of happiness, we want the end goal of what spiritual, spirituality or crossing miracles, 12 step or whatever, are offering, and yet there is a tremendous amount of resistance to the means. So every single day means, every day, you know, the meetings or the, the projects or the, the relationship that's given to, to us on a daily basis, those are the things we actually, uh, like are facing the lack of commitment. That's the things that we're facing. But really, we find out over the years that that's really not the, the actual means that we're resisting. We are really resisting the end because we're afraid of the, the light. There is a lot of fear of the light, of total um, dissolvement of the ego, of this identity, and the security, the self-defense, the no, um, the, the dissolvement of all of that is what we're fear, afraid of. So, so in a way, this journey is is to go toward what we seem to be afraid of. And yet, through a very gentle journey and being guided, and you can see yesterday the movie, Soren had this, like you're, you're saying, this emotion of shame that he experienced probably 10 years ago. And without expressing it to anybody, he completely created his own reality, what he believed about himself, what he think other people would have thought about himself. So he shut down for 10 years. Not only he left the community and not having any relationship, he actually lived in his own apartment in Copenhagen alone for 10 years, completely isolated. 
and got into all kinds of um, things. So, but then he didn't really choose to come out of it by selecting his own path. He didn't say, okay, this is where I started, so I'm going to do, do it different. He didn't. He, he was just willing to say, I feel some spark in my heart to come to this movie project. I thought I have something to offer here. Maybe I can open up again. And he had no idea this, this thing repeat. This is according to his desire to heal. Then this whole thing started to repeat. But he had a, the opportunity to open up this time. And that made all the difference for him. So in a way, the problem may seem vast and impossible, but the solution is actually pretty simple. And the solution is given to us. That's what I found again and again. We don't come up with solutions. The solution is always given to us. And we always have an opportunity to say yes to the solution. So of course, miracles actually says that we're not responsible for the problem. And the way I take it to heart is to say, whatever problem I seem to define or perceive in my daily life, if I'm not responsible, then I wouldn't even go to analyze it anymore. I wouldn't even go looking back, thinking how, how did I do it wrongly? Or why did I do it? And how could I avoid it? I would completely save my mind energy from looking back because I'm not responsible. But I am responsible for accepting the solution. So then every day my mind is given to look for the solution. Any kind of seeming problems, relationship problems, triggers that would come up, physical symptoms, it doesn't matter. Like They all fall into the same category. They're seeming identified, fragmented definitions made by the ego mind. And then I'm just going to ask spirit to provide solutions and say yes to that. Just like what Soren did, when, when the solution is given, hand delivered to his hands, he just need to say yes to that. So yesterday I mentioned a little bit when we started this movie, we had no idea truly what the story or the message that the spirit want me to share. So now it is finished and I watch it over and over again on my own and with people like yourself. And it, it's different. Every time there's a different message and I see something different every time. But I think one thing I can truly say for myself is the spirit really want us to, to see that this spiritual journey, he has got it. He has got it. We, we, we doesn't matter the, the problems that we have. He has got it. He got us. You know, every single character in this, during these 30 days, you know, you can see without anybody trying to fix each other, we're not each other's teacher or therapist. We're just being there together on this journey and allow the spirit to guide us together. And he has done it all, in a way. So. Yeah, I think. There to be some fans because my body is sweating. Okay. We can put on a fan. It's it's it, we just because of the noise, but we can turn one on there and draw a little bit in. Yeah. Hold on. I'll put the fan. Draw off the fans back here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi, um, I just want to say everything you said that my favorite part of the movie was the story of singing expression and that was and everything you just said there about him it's like okay first he had to talk about that old shame and he expressed that but what was underneath that old shame was his fear of 
not trusting anybody to be able to share that, which is what came out so awesome in the scene. So, and, and him accepting that solution and being willing to do that, I was kind of surprised that he sort of, the, the woman playing the piano got him into that without too much resistance on his part. I thought he would, oh, no, I'm not going to do this. This is stupid. But, so I, the whole thing was really neat. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, it's, it, for me it's so beautiful too because traveling around the world I get to see all the little mini steps of, of, of meeting Soren and the different encounters he has and for most people it takes a while to open up to that trust. That even before he came to be part of the movie team, uh, you know, his steps to come to Mexico, um, and, and a couple of my friends, they went, oh, Soren's coming, let's find the perfect house for him to rent, and so he can walk and get his grip. You know, there's all these many, many miracles that go into the light drawing us to be able to trust, because there is a tremendous distrust of, of the spirit, and a tremendous distrust of the end, where this is all headed. The ego is saying it's heading towards obliteration. From its perspective, <laughs> it's not looking good. <laughs> oh, you don't keep going to the light, because <laughs> I won't exist <clears throat> anymore if you go into that light. So, the beautiful thing I think that Francis was just talking about is that it comes back to our our talk about guidance. As I was saying, guidance, even there are spiritual teachers that say, no, you can't really be guided, and that's just all a trick too. Actually, guidance is, is the spirit's use of what the ego made. So, let's say that with the seeming fall from grace, it was such a feeling of chaos that the, the ego invented judgment to stabilize the chaos. That's why there's judgment in the mind now. It's to stabilize the chaos. It's almost like if you went into a, a preschool room and you're a preschool teacher and you went to the bathroom and you came back and it's a food fight. I mean, it's, it's totally gone. There's food flying everywhere and there's food all over. Everybody's just covered. It's just gone into a preschool teacher's nightmare. Gone way on into chaos. No, no rules, no nothing, just a wild chaos. And then the teacher comes in and says, okay, all the boys over here, all the girls, and immediately starts to judge, to bring order into chaos, into that chaotic preschool room. Spiritually, that's, that's, God didn't invent judgment. Judgment is an invention of the ego to bring order, to minimize chaos while still keeping it. You see, that's how sneaky to minimize the chaos while still keeping it. So, the ego made the judgment. Now the Holy Spirit, Jesus, can use what the ego made. And the ego made the judgment as a separating device to keep the mind fragmented and in confusion and guilt and shame and fear. The Spirit uses the judgment to guide us. Go here, visit this person, talk to this person on the phone uses the specific judgments in the labyrinth or maze of complexity that the ego has made to, to literally guide the mind out of the labyrinth. And that's why guidance is so essential. When I got to a point too where I felt like I need to, to tap into higher guidance is because if I was letting go of my career, I was letting go of all my future goals, I was letting go of how I wanted it to turn out for David in this lifetime, and saying, now you be the guide. You use the puppet of David, you use everything, you use everything for the greater good, and that was the, the, my willingness to turn over this mechanism of trying to control my personal life and giving over control control of the puppet strings, of the marionette strings. You speak the words. You do the actions. You do this for the greater good, and you unwind me from this labyrinth of time and space that the ego made. Jesus, if you boil down the teachings of Jesus from the Beatitudes to just two words, 
the teachings of Jesus were judged not. If you want the longer version, judge not lest you be judged. Because whatever judgment you mete out, you're really doing it to yourself. And you're going to keep yourself from knowing who you really are by judging. Because God didn't create the judging. And the ego is keeping you trapped in the small identity through the judgments. Somebody one time asked me, I forget where I was in the world, they said, uh, those are great teachings, judge not, but I don't understand. Uh, we've had trouble for 2,000 years uh, applying that. You know, Buddha had some good things to say, Jesus did, but it's the practical application of the teachings is where the struggle is. And they said, so maybe you can tell me how to stop judging. And I said, well, it's kind of like trying to stop a runaway freight train that's going down the mountain. When you ask me, how do I stop judging? It's like, how do I stop the runaway freight train that's going down the mountain that's off the tracks? You don't. You don't stop judging. You have to go into a miracle in your mind that, that goes prior to the judgment, where you come to see the impossibility of judgment. You can't stop an ego tactic without going beyond. Like Einstein says, you can't solve the problem at the level of the problem. How in the world do you stop judgment at the level of judgment? The ego is laughing like, come on, let's have a good try here to see how you can stop me because the e this is the ego's world. This is the whole ego's <laughs> cosmos and there's no escaping on the screen. If this whole world is a battlefield, how do you escape the battlefield except by rising above it in your awareness, transcending it? That's what quantum physics is helping us do too, transcend. So, how do you stop the judgment is you simply say, okay, the ego made this, it's, it's complicating my mind, it's very confusing, but I can I can give over to Jesus, to the Holy Spirit, everything that the ego made. So I'm going to give the judgment in my mind over to Jesus. And what you do is you put it out of your personal control and responsibility. And then you say, here I'm going to give you all the judgment in my mind, everything I've ever learned. Now you use it to free me from this very difficult trap. And that's what guidance is. When you get those little nudges to call somebody, to visit somebody, to hug somebody, to go and join somebody for lunch and just laugh and laugh and laugh and feel the joy and happiness of, of our true being, those are guidances. And I think if, if I told you the, the parable of Francis or the parable of David, Francis was married, she um, was it one house or two? Two houses. She owned her own business. Um, she was on. She would be successful as far as the world judges things. And yet, she had different points along her spiritual journey where she started to realize that anything that involved her attachment, anything that involved her possession, anything that involved a state of control in the mind, anything at all was blocking her from knowing her true reality. So, sometimes I've said if we had an encyclopedia or a dictionary that said, Spiritual Awakening, see Francis, yeah. jump ahead to Francis. Because there's a lot of things in there where the world would say, she's got the world on a string, like the old Frank Sinatra song. She, yeah, got the string around my finger, sitting on a rainbow. The string around my finger, what a world, what a life. You see, this is where the ego thinks, I've escaped. I've escaped heaven and I've done a pretty good job adapting. You had a successful, what the world would judge as successful self-concept. There's nothing more dangerous and treacherous than believing you have a successful self-concept. What happens if you make up an idol and you dress it up and you put all kinds of positive things around it? Are you going to be willing to question the idol if you think you've got the world on the string? You've managed the escape. And in my case too, it was like a sense of 10 years of university. What was all that education about? I really wasn't 
they're really trying to pursue degrees or trying to build a career. I was like, after high school, I was giving myself a little time to ask that question, what's it all about? I spent a lot of those 10 years, there was a big woods uh, next to the University of Cincinnati, so I was taking long walks, what's it all about? Why am I doing all these academic studies? For degrees, what would the degrees bring me? Uh, a career, instead of flipping burgers at McDonald's, I could have a career. Why would I want a career? Because it would give you more money. Why would you want more money? It's because I could have a better life. Jesus is like, really? You think more money would actually bring you a better life? You believe that more money would bring you a better life? Well, it also would bring me a relationship. Oh, you believe you need the money for the relationship? That's right. I'm not going to have the partner unless I have the money. Interesting, you believe. You know, Jesus was like, on these talks in the woods, he was like saying, wow, I can see you want to be happy. That's your birthright. I can see you want to be free. That's your birthright. I can see that you, you want to, to live a life of peace. That's your birthright. But Jesus said, you're going about it all the wrong way because you think these things can be found in form. You think you can achieve in the future peace, achieve happiness, achieve joy through accomplishment in time and space. He's like, whoa, you've got a serious issue going on in your mind because you've got all the right ideas but you're pursuing them in all the wrong ways. You're never going to experience the things that you want if, if you go about it that way. So I said, well, what's the alternative? He said, it's like Morpheus. I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. Out of, out of academia, let go of the family concept. Let go of your future career aspirations. Let go of all your future relationship aspirations. Let go of everything that you think you know about this world and everything you think you want and let me guide you and I will unwind your mind from space and time. In fact, if the way, the truth, and the life says I will unwind you from space and time, it would be wise to follow a guide that has transcended <laughs> space and time. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. That's the best guide in the universe, is one that has transcended time and space. I see your hand going up. Hi. Um, this is my first experience with Course in Miracles here with you, that, and you, you know. And it's, I have to preface my question. Um, all the stuff you're talking about is, seems right on, as far as I, my understanding of Jesus Christ. And, but I'm trying to put my head around the fact that you said we're not fallen from grace. It was a mis, we, we mistook that. And it, according to what I know in the Bible, there was a fall from grace, and we all needed to be redeemed. And uh, that's the point of Jesus dying on the cross and going to heaven. And then so... I don't feel it's within me without that fact, you know? And so how I hear you talking is wonderful, and I love it. And I'm trying to meld together how to be conscious, aware, and a believer in that Jesus is who he said he is, you know? Yeah. And so uh, I don't understand. Maybe when we were born, if no one messed with us, we'd be okay. <laughs> no human being got to us. I don't think so, but... Uh, I think there was a fall from grace and there has to come that moment when we realize we're forgiven through what he said he did. And yeah, yeah, we can talk about that. It's it's perfect question for someone who has a, a Judeo-Christian awareness of what's commonly accepted on the planet. In the Bible it talks about the fall from grace in Genesis and Adam and Eve and so forth and the snake and, and being deceived and, and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I was, I was raised Christian and, and the Protestant faith, so I'm very well aware of the whole dynamic you're talking about. 
In A Course in Miracles, Jesus describes the fall in a different way than, than with Adam and Eve. And basically, his version of the fall in A Course in Miracles is into eternity where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. So there was a, it's described as a fall from grace, but the entire Course in Miracles is aimed at the correction for the fall. So as Francis said before, Jesus says in the Course, you're not responsible for the error, but you are responsible for accepting the correction to the error. So, what we would call salvation, returning to God, returning to that oneness and that love of God, is a matter of a decision in the mind which Jesus made. So in that sense, He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way shower. He's the savior. He's the demonstration of waking up from this dream of separation. And so, in A Course in Miracles, he, he will lay it out and even describe of A Course in Miracles, Helen Shuckman and her collaborator at one point after they were taking down this dictation from Jesus, they asked the same question that many people around the world ask. How could this have happened in the first place? Very good ontological question. If, if everything is love and everything is perfect, how could there be a fall from that perfection. And the way Jesus answered them, the, the two original ones taking down this book, was you can tell by your experiences as a human being, the emotional roller coaster ride that you experience, that you believe it did happen. And your mind is very powerful. So if you give your mind to a belief, it doesn't change God, it doesn't change truth, it doesn't change reality. But in your awareness, you experience that fall, you experience that separation. And he said, that's why I'm sharing this course. The course is not full of just positive affirmations, all is one, all is God, all is love. It actually spends 31 chapters about the ego and exposing the ego. It, it speaks to the mind that's asleep and dreaming as if the fall is real. And yet it does say, that atonement, which is the correction, is, is a, a complete escape from the past and a total lack of interest in the future. And the atonement is the awareness that the separation never happened. So this is a very high, high, high ideal. This is about self-realization. And, and until the mind reaches that state, where it has no problems, no difficulties, no cares, no worries, no stress, nothing but happiness and joy, then it's like taking it as if the separation occurred. And he even puts those words in italics, as if. Uh, as if there are two parts to the mind, as if the separation occurred. So it's a good question, and I would say too, in terms of Jesus dying on our cross, he just he says in there that um, many sincere Christians have, have misunderstood the, the crucifixion. Uh, the, the, the salvation did not occur from dying on the cross. The only message, he says, of the crucifixion was teach only love, for that is what you are. There is nothing sacrificial about knowing who you are. It's a matter of acceptance of the divinity. But the resurrection, which is described as rolling away the stones and, and as if he came out from the, the sepulcher. I love that word, sepulcher. I just do these gatherings. I'll probably be in a cave someday, but while I'm still, I still get to say sepulcher. As well, he comes out from the sepulcher, the cave, the tomb. Um, that seemed to be the resurrection where the body of Jesus came back to Mary Magdala. She saw him first and then to the apostles and so forth. He's saying, no, this, the resurrection is in your mind. When you accept the correction for the error in your mind, that is the resurrection. That was just a tiny little symbol of Jesus, a very helpful symbol, you know, appearing to Mary Magdala and, and the apostles. But that was just a symbol that you can't really kill the Christ. 
Bodies can always be destroyed, always will be. They're very temporary in nature. But what he was teaching us was, he's saying, join me in letting me guide your mind to unwind from the ego and accept the correction, this, as I did. I did it, and now I'm the way shower. I will show you how to do it through guidance, through the Holy Spirit, uh, to do it. So it gives a, a really good perspective. That's a, that's like a real summation of what the Course in Miracle is. Is it? It still could correct some of these ideas of sacrifice. Somehow that God demanded that a beloved son had to suffer uh, in order for redemption to occur. Jesus is saying, no, it's actually through miracles and through salvation and atonement, through correction, that, that the correction occurs, not through any type of suffering and sacrifice. But that was an ego interpretation of, of uh, one, one person's got to take the fall for the rest of humanity. And it's just, he's just saying it's just a misinterpretation of the, the crucifixion. Yes. We got one here. Uh, yes, you mentioned uh, you know the twelve and twelve, and uh, it is very true. You, you got to be willing to do the work, and what you put in to it is what you get back. And uh, you know, on my journey as I'm walking walking through, I'm realizing all my trials and tribulations is really God's way of bringing me closer to Him. And uh, as I watched the movie last night, which I thought was awesome and very well put together, I'm realizing I have a long ways to go. And it really, it's just a starting gun. But my question is, in watching that, I'm realizing that the monastery was awesome. I would love to reach that point. Because it really does come about, for the healing to take place, you've got to really be able to release. And you talked about how the unconscious mind is plagued and polluted. And I think most people aren't really thinking like that, you know. But it is a serious uh, condition to really get the, um, a true relationship with Jesus and really get on the correct path. What is the best way to uh, to, re to start releasing until I'm able to get to the point of maybe being at the monastery? What would I do in my daily life to really uh, take part in beginning the healing by doing baby steps of uh, starting the release program? Okay, that's a great question. That was that was my number one question to Jesus. As soon as I I was aware that there was an unconscious aspect, and I thought. That's devious. That is really devious. How do I bring the shadow uh, into awareness? And and basically Jesus said, it's, it's through, again, through my desire, through the desire to have it come up. And you were talking about bringing all those emotions up, really opening the mind up. I was voted most quiet. I had a lot of denial and repression going on. And so as I went into the Course, I started to realize that, that there were certain mechanisms that, that could bring the unconscious up in a more accelerated way. Number one, relationships. Uh, you know, if, if you want to really stay in denial and repression, be a hermit. If you, want, if you want to mix paths or whatever, but if you really want to follow Jesus in the most rapid way in saving time, relationships are right out of the bat. Uh, number one way. In fact, Jesus spends out of 31 chapters, he spends nine chapters devoted wholly to relationships. Chapters 15 to 24. He calls them special hate relationships and special love relationships. The special love relationships are much more insidious and sneaky than the hate relationships. When you have a hate relationship, you, you have a conscious awareness that you need forgiveness because you're hating somebody. But when you love somebody and you think you love them and you don't even know what true divine love is, then that is a sneaky trick. In fact, Jesus even says that when the falls seem to occur, the Holy Spirit was given as the immediate answer to the fall from grace. And the ego answered the Holy Spirit immediately with a special love relationship <laughs> as a way to distract the mind from the correction. Romantic relationship is like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be like the Klingons in Star Trek. Cloaking device. 
a cloaking device behind a special love relationship. We all know. Everyone's nodding their heads. Everyone's been through that ringer, huh? Susanna and Jeffrey, <laughs> they were acting it out in the movie so everybody could see. That's, that's it. But holy relationship, which is really what you can feel it happening in 12 steps, you know, where people come in there, give in their lead, pour in their hearts out, come in there to work the steps, come in there with a devotion to healing. It's a spiritual program, there's no doubt. Yeah, And it's a spiritual program that does involve relationships. This is not go to the Himalayas and meditate for 12 hours a day. You know, this is, the, the program is, a, is, a, is one that involves relationships. So I would say first off, it's going to be relationships. Second thing that comes to mind is, the ego is the defense against the healing. But the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they know the escape. They know the escape route. They know the fastest escape route. In fact, Jesus would even say that the traditional means of spiritual awakening, contemplation, um, uh, long hours of meditation, when you look back at the history of spiritual awakening, there are certain techniques. Jesus says those are tedious and time consuming. He's going to offer the fast track as a contrast to the others which will work because of their the purpose behind them. They will work, but they will be very long. They always offer a future escape to a present condition. Long hours of meditation are looking way off into the future for an escape from the present condition. Holy relationship is the, is the spirit's use of the relationships as mirrors to reflect back. And you can tell in the program when you have issues and grievances, even when somebody's giving their lead or you meet somebody and all of a sudden you start to feel rubbed the wrong way, you feel troubled and bothered, that's because the mirroring is coming in there. They're just mirroring the unconscious mind, which I talked about. But the other thing I like to emphasize is because the spirit can use what the ego made, in my case, in the parable of David, I liked music. I had trouble meditating, but I liked music. So Jesus said, well, I'll just design, I'll teach you how to have music meditations, because you love music so much. I will use the music to help train your mind to become still. I like movies. I'm a movie buff, a Hollywood buff. So Jesus would take me to the movies, and then during the movie, he would give me commentary, he would have me sit in the theater until they chased me out, and then I'd go to my car, and then it was another hour or two, crying, emotions. I'd say something like, well that, that movie was so sad, and Jesus said, no, your perception of the movie was sad. The movie wasn't sad, the movie didn't make you feel sad, you feel sad because of your thoughts and beliefs. Now here I am to help you sort through those false thoughts and beliefs. But don't tell me about scary movies, and don't tell me about sad movies and heartbreaking movies. He said, no, it's, it's in your consciousness is where it is. So that's another part. And, and I would say even Francis allowing this movie to be made through you was because you had, a, you could see the value of, of movies. So the spirit will use what you found find valuable. Sports was another thing for me. So Jesus had me playing tennis, not to win, not to become highly skilled at tennis, but actually using it more like an open-eyed Zen meditation of learning to come into a state of perfect non-judgment through the tennis and golf the same way. The more focused you are on your faith, the more presence that, or the more Jesus is going to make his presence known to, to you. Like you were speaking about the table. Take away everything you know about the table, and then you'll see my presence. So that's kind of the best way to really start the healing process and understanding how to release and just get to that higher level of consciousness and, uh, of course, a stronger yeah. relationship with uh, yeah. using the what Father. Spirit will use what you already have. It's not like you have to learn. I didn't have to learn Tai Chi and learn yoga and learn postures and learn breathing. 
I had to practice with golf, tennis, baseball, <laughs> and above all relationships uh, that were already in place. That, so it wasn't about trying to go and learn a bunch of new techniques, it was more like the Spirit saying, you already enjoy these things, so I will use what you already enjoy to dismantle the self-concept. And I also just want to add one more thing. Um, because you're talking about release and because we all see that in the movie yesterday how helpful if you have someone there to you don't have to put the mask on you can just say things as they are but what was making it possible was the shared purpose you know with with the people that come together the group that that um, come together and then when we start to share something, especially at the beginning, it's very tempting because the way we perceive the world is from a perspective. The ego wants us to believe we're the victim. So we, things happen to us, people do things to us that's against our will. Underneath it is always a message, something is lacking here. Something is lacking here. So let me complain about what is lacking that triggered me to feel this way. So that is a kind of a way that seems to to be the initial expression. You know, we notice when we start to express, express as inevitable, it seems like the ping, finger wants to point. And it's very helpful when the one listening just to be able to guide you. Instead of pointing it back at you or engage in the story, together to find a, a common uh, victimizer with you, join you in the victimhood. It's very helpful to have someone who can hold the truth with you and to say, oh, that's your emotion. What is, what is the thoughts? What are the beliefs? And then in the end, can guide you into the core and then say, if you, do you really believe that? Is, that? is that what you choose to believe? Or do you, are you willing to to release it. So it's a very helpful process. And we have been, when I was in the monastery, we, we have been doing it with each other, then we started to put it on the paper. When we don't have people around us, we, we jot it down in notes, so it worked. And now, um, the community, our community, actually de designed the whole process into an app. And the app is free. So it become more and more interactive, and so interactive now that you can just download it onto your phone and it will just start to say, how are you doing today? And you can say, I don't know whether it's a voice activated or if you have to type a few words, and it guides you through the whole process. So even if you don't have a mighty companion by your side that you feel safe to open up, you still can open up with any kind of trigger that you have throughout the day. So that's a very helpful process. Yeah, the app, the Spiri app has, it, it does now work with Google Talk. So you could literally be there with your phone and Spiri's like, how are you feeling? Well, I'm, <coughs> I'm disturbed about this and this and this and it will literally, as if you have a, a psychotherapist there, <laughs> verbally with your iPhone, <laughs> It will take you down to, to the release point in your mind, which is everything is a decision. Spirit. Spirit is the spirit without the T. Yes. Spirit. <laughs> Drop the cross. Drop the cross at the end. <laughs> spirit. <laughs> spirit is both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say something about the movie. Do you hear me okay? It sounds like it's bouncing. Um, one thing I really loved about the movie, the thing she said, was um, Soren opening up. At first, you know, you see him sitting there all quiet, shut down. Um, is it not working? Tech right? support. It's like Vanilla Sky. Tech support. Is it not working right? No, okay. All, all quiet. Okay. He's all quiet and shut down, and it's like he's 
sitting on his anger, and the lady playing piano and singing. Uh, she's so free and spontaneous, and she's able to open him up, pull out that shut down anger in him, and she plays with the anger, and she converts that anger into joy. And so many of us are like that, and um, and I find that in my, I mean, I see myself in him too, and um, I get like that at times, but most of the time I try to be free and open and express myself, because I don't like to keep things shut down for too long. And um, I find that when people, uh, other people, they see another person like him, they're afraid. And uh, I mean, some people are afraid. They're afraid to approach them. They're afraid of them. And I think it's because they're afraid of the anger in themselves. And they don't want to confront it, and they don't want to deal with it. And um, it's like you're talking about the mirror. You know, and it's like, what I saw in him, like in the beginning, he, he, he wanted control, he wanted to control, and he wanted to be directing. And uh, he didn't know how to relinquish that control. And as she brought him out of himself, he was like a beautiful flower opening up. And later on that, you know, like he had that, he wanted to be able to, you know, over in Europe, a woman that he wanted, that he liked, you know, he didn't have the nerve to approach her. And if he had been open like that in the beginning, she probably would have noticed him and liked him. And I, I don't know, I think it's important to, you know, free yourself like that. And when I, I, one, one more thing I want to say is I, when we talk about Jesus and the Christ, I mean, to me, the Christ means like the light, enlightenment, and uh, Jesus is the person uh, that was sent here and, um, in human form, and he had characteristics of humans. I mean, he went to the temple, and he uh, didn't like what was going on with the money changers, and he got angry and turned over the tables and all that, and because uh, they weren't respectful of the temple. And... Uh, you know, it's always important to me to know that he had feelings, you know, he expressed himself you know, in human you know, terms, you know, and that makes me feel closer to Jesus when I know that he was, he had these characteristics. And um, when I was a child, I always loved Jesus. Um, I just had trouble with the God concept. And um, I find that since I've been, over the years, I was angry at God, that I'm not angry at God anymore, but uh, over the years, um, I've come to change my concept of God, which has really helped me a lot. I'm in the 12-step program, too. And uh, anyway, I, and I love how you two, or how you express yourselves, and, and uh, you're so fluent. I wish the book were written in the way you speak, you know, because I would be able to understand it so much better the way both of you speak. But I just have trouble understanding the book the way it's written. But maybe things will change later. I really don't know. But anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're kind of like translators. That's, that's yeah. our job now is to, to put it into common layman's terms, layman terms with yeah. lots of examples and everything. And I'm, I'm so glad a few people have brought up that sequence with Soren and with Netta. Such a beautiful sequence yeah. in the movie. The thing about the, the teachings is that everything, without exception, is, is love or a call for love. And I think that was a good example of, at the beginning, um, Netta started off with sounds and started off trying to get Soren to sing, I trust you. And, oh, oh, oh. I, I want to trust you. Oh, you know, you see his voice is cracking, you know, it's almost like you're asking the impossible. Uh, and then she stopped playing and then she realized, okay, let's, let's have allowance here. 
let, let me hear your call for love underneath what the form is. And I want you now to start saying, I don't trust you. You see how playful, how much, how love doesn't have any expectations. It's just welcoming. Welcoming him to start singing, I don't trust you. Which he got into immediately. His voice grew stronger <laughs> seemingly when he, would, he could sing that because it was more resonant with where his mind was. And that just was a good starting point. And then he kind of, what was he came around to? But I don't know. And then she joined him in the I don't know. I want to know. She, I want to feel. It just progressed from there. She didn't even try to throw it back. But you know. She said, I don't know. <laughs> you know see, see how she stayed right in the, the truth of things. In, in the not knowing. Just in the being willing to be used. Now, if you look at the dynamics of that, if everything is either love or a call for love, then in both cases you would respond with love. To love or to a call for love. But the ego filter, that's where the, the difficulty comes in, is the ego perceives a third option that isn't really there. And that third option is attack. And as soon as you perceive attack, you will either defend or reciprocate, because that's what the ego is. The ego itself is an attack thought. The belief that there is no God, the belief that there is no heaven, that's an attack thought. It's a false identity. So, I think with the movie you could see it, and I know for, in my experiences, that's one of the reasons why Jesus has taken us on the road for this, that has taken me on the road for the last 20, 28 years, is because I see these travels and meeting with all my brothers and sisters as loads and loads and loads of opportunities. Because that's what everything is in this world. It's just an opportunity to learn everything is love or a call for love. If you stay in the humbleness of that, you always experience your heart opening up and expanding in the awareness of love. And every time the temptation comes in to perceive an attack, that's where you start to realize, what's going on? Where have I identified my mind with an illusion? Because if, if I'm in attack mode or defense mode, then I clearly have lost my way. I clearly am, am trying to perpetuate a false identity. And the more you practice it, just like with the 12 steps, the more you give yourself over to it, the more you practice it, the more you feel the, the goodness of it, the, the helpfulness of it. And that's really made all the difference. That's, for me, it's been in the practical application. It's one thing to read the book. Many people have struggles with the book. All the double negatives, you know, they're like, why would Jesus use so many double negatives? Except maybe he was playfully teaching us that you're trying to undo what never happened in the first place. And he's playing with the language. You know, he's playfully using everything that is available to human beings to, to teach us to, to learn to be light. To learn to be gentle. In order to get the gifts of uh, the promises, like, it, like you're uh, receiving sobriety or working the 12 steps, in order to get those, you've got to really read the book and understand it. Even if the words are a bit confusing, you've got to take the time to kind of detangle it and really get a comprehension of what it's telling you. And then once you do, then those gifts really do come to life. You know? And that's what I'm experiencing. Yes. That somebody that I asked to come and saw most of the movie last hey, night. A woman that came last night and saw most of the movie, uh, she wanted me to this morning ask if anybody knows of any of this type of singing kind of thing that is available in this area because that was really powerful. In fact, all three of us thought that was really a wonderful technique to be able to lift up uh, instead of going down into uh, but to be able to, uh, you know what a wonderful way to be able to let that come out so if anybody knows of anyone who, who is like a practitioner of that kind of technique 
that would be really wonderful and there's women that I work with that I'd love to be able to also bring that to. The other thing that I wanted to say before was that I'm a long time meditator and what I have discovered over the last 50 years is that as a spiritual being who came into this limited physical experience, the whole idea is contrast to go through that veil and not remember who we are. And so the whole journey is about remembering, remembering who we are and remembering as part of the whole, of the one. And so all of this contrast that we are experiencing, including what we want to call the ego, which is just not remembering that we are the creators of this experience, that God gave us the will to be able to be the creators. And that by that experience, because what else are we going to do for an eternity? We are eternal. I know that from experience being in that meditative, connected place every day. And so it's like, okay, this is my opportunity. Do I want to be a part of the crowd, which is the paradigm that is opposite to who we are so that we can remember and experience what that is? To, oh yeah, I'm the creator of this. Isn't that wonderful? We're the ones that have created this world and we're the ones that we've been waiting for to change it. And that to me is such an amazing, beautiful blessing. But I only got that when I got that. Well, the first question, voice liberation is the, te the words that we've kind of used with it. And um, it has emerged um, at the monastery, but actually, um, uh, I think Emily's doing some of it over there in Spain, and, and Netta is over in Holland. And so, uh, in terms of that specific thing, there's a presence underneath it. It's, I wouldn't say it's a technique. Um, at all. It has to come from a deep place of healing that's underneath it, but, but certainly it involves music and, and, and Netta has been a Course in Miracles student for some time and, and recently, in the past few years, has gone much, much deeper and then put herself out there as available along with um, Emily and everything, but we do have nothing going on specifically in this area, but we do have a, a seven-day retreat going on in, in a castle in the south of Holland, in the Netherlands, um, which there will, we will include movies and we'll have voice liberation and, and everything, but um, so it's, you know, we, we wherever uh, those um, come together with the Spirit's purpose for the voice liberation, then that is given as an offering along with a lot of other things. She'll be doing some meditations, actually uh, guided meditations as well as voice liberation over there in Holland. And then the, the other thing is that, well the metaphysics of the Course are not your typical metaphysics. Uh, when we use the word create, the, this world was not created and this is not a part of the New Age create your own reality or create reality experience. Um, the teachings of the Course in Miracles from Jesus are very, very different uh, from these kind of New Age kind of teachings. And admittedly, when you go into meditation, you can have very deep experiences, union experiences, even mystical experiences, revelatory glimpses of the reality. But there's often a lot of um, misunderstanding around creation or co-create, you know, being a co-creator with God. Uh, the Course does teach that, that we are indeed co-creators with God, but that's in the spiritual realm. Uh, co-creation does not involve time and space. Again, the ego projected all of time and space, and so there is no creation happening in the realm of time and space. And these metaphysics are actually important to come to a very deep, consistent state of mind where you don't where you actually let go of the projections of the world and you come to what might be called more like a Zen, open-eyed meditation where your whole life becomes a meditation. It's not, it's not something you do for years, it's not some practice, it's not some technique, it's not something that's separate. It's like your life becomes a living meditation, like a song of prayer that you constantly are singing that happy, grateful, joyful song. So. The beauty of, of this is that it just takes 
the willingness to not try to bring truth into illusions, but the main teaching of the Course is reinforced over and over with all of the workbook lessons and everything, is you must bring the illusions to the truth. And what he means by that is he's saying the illusions of make-believe belief, whatever you believe about yourself that isn't true, is the illusion. And he says you made the ego by believing in it and you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. But that's, that's a, a daily practice. That's a practice that we use at the monastery and we use in our lives. And that's also something that just allows the emotions to just come up because there's nothing positive about the world. It's just like a, a prayer of the heart to let anything that's blocking the light come into awareness so it can be released. So that's very much of a practice. Jesus wasn't political. He did not try to effect any change whatsoever on the world. In fact, um, in, apart from what we could call manifesting, which is a whole other topic, uh, manifesting does have a value in the sense that it, it does start to show you more and more the power of the mind, but it's not the goal. The goal isn't manifesting. The goal isn't trying to make anything different. The teachings of the Course are pretty radical. Uh, they, they teach, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. But the, the shift of purpose from hatred to love, or from, from shame and guilt and pain to one of, of forgiveness is, is one that takes a lot of mind training. And that's actually the purpose of the Course, is to save time through the mind training. But some of the ideas you were sharing, the, yeah, these are teachings as you go really deep into toward the Christ, you start to realize that that creation does not apply um, to what we, we would say the perceptual world. All of perception, even the highest state of consciousness, the highest state of forgiveness, the state of, of complete salvation, we would call it, is still an illusion. Even Salvation is an illusion, not something to be glossed over because it's the learning goal of, of A Course in Miracles. But the goal of the Course is not love, and the goal of the Course is not eternity, because what is blocking the awareness of that love, that divine love or eternity, is what needs to be exposed and released and forgiven. So it's very much uh, with everything, it's like training your mind to hand over the illusions in thought and belief to the light. And that's another reason why we focus so much on no people pleasing and no private thoughts. That's why those are the guidelines of our monastery, because we're trying to do that with every single thing that arises, whether it's a, a physical perception of a physical ailment, an emotional attitude. Um, there's two lessons in A Course in Miracles where Jesus does a discourse on death, where Jesus says, a stab of pain, a little worldly pleasure, and even a sigh of weariness are all death. A sigh of weariness is death. Okay, well the spirit does, isn't weary. <laughs> He'll come back with, you know, you're not really capable of being tired, but you are very capable of wearying yourself. The strain of constant judgment is exhausting and intolerable. This is coming from the Christ mind. So the metaphysics from the Course are beyond all of the, I call them stepping stones, create your own reality, manifest a different world, and so on and so forth. Those are all just like the Arantia book, a little more stepping stone, but it's not the ultimate reality. But thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else have anything? Yes. Just a couple of basic questions. Where is the monastery in Utah? Like, the part of it, that when you went into the little town, yes. I'm just yeah. curious. It's about 
if you landed, if you flew over here from uh, from Los Angeles and you landed in Salt Lake City, it's about two hours drive south and east of Salt Lake City Airport. And so when you saw the van, you know, taking mm -hmm. the group of people from the airport, that's uh, Susanna greeting her her mother and her aunt. Uh, that was at Salt Lake City Airport. And then when they got in the van, it was about a two-hour drive. And it's about 49 acres. Um, it's tucked, you saw those uh, giant cliffs and everything. Yeah. It's, it's almost like kind of a little bit of an otherworldly kind of feel. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been used for now a decade in many different ways. We've had all different types of music festivals, Strawberry Fields, some of you were part of Strawberry Fields movie, Music, Movies, Enlightenment, Music Festival, Silence, silence Personal Stays occasionally. Um, so it's been used in a, in a number of different ways over those last 10 years. And my other question came up because I was going to do the how long did it take to do the film? Uh, we film. We only filmed for a month. Uh, for a month. So it's because the mystery school uh, was a month-long retreat. So we filmed for a month, and then it took from that point about two years to finish. Two, yeah. But uh, there was a couple of a few months before that to. Yeah, and a little bit of Iceland in there, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you noticed that it's not the ice. So now I have that Led Zeppelin song. Let the ice and snow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, I, I haven't. I haven't got any uh, guidance in terms of another project like that. But right now, we actually I, I finished everything uh, May this year, and then immediately there was um, a clear um, direction to show the movie in August in the monastery. We have a big retreat, and then in the retreat. We basically shared with all the participants that this is as far as we got in our mind. You know, we haven't gone beyond this point. We showed it for the first time. It was a premiere. We have no idea the next step. We, so actually on location, we invited everybody to join us in the prayer as to where to go from there. So, <laughs> so we're here now. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful just to watch the ideas that flow because when we, when it was showed at uh, the monastery, um, different people came forth and Miriam was, was one of them. That's how we're here. Miriam, there she is. She invited us and there was actually a, a man in the audience who works at Stanford University who was saying, hmm, I think I could maybe get this into... Stanford University, it may take a couple of years. So there's little kind of invitations that come sprinkling around and we're just staying open. But the feeling was it wasn't like a typical motion picture where you have like a marketing plan for and you try to engage in that. It's more just going where the invitations are. And and I like to think of it as a, it's just a beautiful calling card and a beautiful backdrop for this deep connecting that we're doing, this heart-to-heart -heart connecting, to me that's what everything's always about, is the spirit just is orchestrating things and um, I do feel Jesus will probably use this film in, in many ways that we aren't even aware of but we're right at the cusp of I know for Frances she was thrilled when the movie was completed <laughs> like wow I did my job uh, being as like a guided prayerful uh, movie maker, and now when you get into how it's used, the distribution, it's, it's almost like when you finish a book or something else, you know, you have to see how the Spirit's going to use that. Yeah, it was such a journey because when, when I first took it on, when the movie, it was clear that this, this was going to happen after so many years having it in the back of my mind, 
And originally it happened because uh, someone showed up, a director showed up to initiate the project. That was the first. And then we had all the other team members ready. And then when we talked to the director, we realized um, the way that it's going to happen is completely different than what we have envisioned. There was a script. There was It was not going to be guided. It was not going to be spontaneous. It was not going to be... Um, just a journey for everybody to listen and follow. So we have to decide not to go that route and all of a sudden there was no director anymore and the team was coming. So so I then it was clear that I, I'm to step in as a director and to take this on as a listen and follow. And I, I really see it as like a journey for myself to to strengthen that and to, to be able to lead a team. Because, you know, along the way, all these reflections that this is not the way, this is not the way we do things, it's, it's really just my own doubt thoughts that they come up for me to strengthen this, this relationship with the guidance. So, so it took me that long to be able to sit with this uncompromising position every day to find the message and find it and share and, and, and there are many, many stories of listen and follow and there's really no other message through this. Many times uh, I was sharing earlier in, in the August retreat, we had so many difficulties <coughs> with this. At one point we lost the whole movie. The whole footage was, was done, was gone. Um, after a year and a half of, we just finished editing, we're just about to bring it to a studio to do the color. Um, then we, we took it off my hard drive. We lost it and then uh, we have to really use prayer to say maybe that's maybe this is it. The whole point is for me to detach from a worldly result, and it's never about that, anyways. And Soren it was Soren who was helping me with editing at the point, and he said I need to sort the footage because it reflects the chaos in my mind. So even though the the, the footage was diagnosed, deemed um, corrupted by Apple. He went in and he sorted out just for the sake of clearing his mind. Then it came back. So it's, it's, it's this whole journey of we don't know how the problem happened. We definitely did not have a solution in terms of our own I know mind. So we pray, we pray, we let ourselves be guided. We had formed this deep relationship with everybody that came to join the movie because we have to clear every obstacles that stand in our relationships in order for us to move forward. So relationship has been leading the way for this project and we have to constantly let go of the end result. Jeffrey was the founder of this whole movie and yet he was in the follower position throughout this whole project to listen and follow to receive the reward of the guidance, really. We're all receivers of, of the reward of the guidance. But in the end, you know, the movie came, came out, but more as a byproduct of what we have received along the way, the relationship we have received with each other, with, with the, the spirit, the strength we have developed in the actual listening and following, and then, we thought, okay, what is happening next is the same. It's a continuation of the journey to be guided and feel like Jesus is guiding us to, to come to your life now, to, to, to have a deep relationship with you, with more people, you know. So that's, that feels like what this is truly about. It's kind of like the Zen mandala, you know, how the, they, they paint those pictures with the sand so carefully sometimes for weeks, months, or years, and then they bring the rake in. If you think about what I, I opened up with, that, that actually what quantum is showing us, what Jesus is showing us, what the whole universe is showing us now, is that time is, 
simultaneous and it's not linear. So when Francis had that point where the whole, all the data was deemed corrupted after all that work, you know, it was like, well, maybe that's the lesson. Maybe the movie was just to take me into an experience of, of letting go of the movie. You see how deep this goes, you have to let go of everything. But if time is simultaneous and it's not linear, then that means again that right here and right now is everything for us. Uh, we, we are here, Miriam is a, a therapist and she's invited us and I think of uh, Abraham Maslow, you know, because I went through a lot of training for psychology and everything. Abraham Maslow, the hierarchy of needs, the pyramid, remember the pyramid? Remember what was at the top of the pyramid? Self-actualization was at the top of Maslow's pyramid. And so he went around and studied the most actualized people to draw his principles, not in a Newtonian way, but just to listen, what is your state of mind like? You're so happy, you're so joyful. Instead of studying the sickest people, Maslow, aha, uh -huh, as a psychologist decided, maybe if I study the most healthy people I can find, like Eleanor Roosevelt, <laughs> you know, that, she was part of his study, he studied the healthiest ones, and what he discovered by, in these self-actualizing ones is that means and end were not separate. In, let's say an artist is painting a painting, they're not thinking about finishing the painting, they're not thinking about who they're going to sell the painting to, how much money they can get from selling the painting. They're just in the moment. The joy is in the moment. We know that from children. The glee is in the moment. They're playing, playing all summer long until they, come on in, it's time to eat, it's time for lunch. Lunch? What's that? You know, I mean, it's, it's, when you're in the glee of the moment, you're playing with the fish and the crawdad and the stream and everything, you're not really thinking of lunch, because lunch is what? Future. So, to me, that was the beauty of, of the whole experience of this movie, is that the movie isn't a product, but the movie is a state of mind. And even when they were, had to do the colorization, they things didn't work out in Mexico, so they sent two separate hard drives of the movie over to Portugal for the colorization. Well, it turns out that the Portuguese uh, immigration and uh, customs, they took the movies, both hard drives, and would not release the movies and began penalizing using the credit card <laughs> of the foundation to enact a daily penalty as they had held these two hard drives with the movies in there because, it turns out, that the, the company that was going to be doing the work had not paid their taxes. <laughs> and so, imagine getting to the whole point now, the movie is recovered, you've sent it off for colorization and everything, and now it's impounded <laughs> with penalties every day. <laughs> when you called me up, you're like, they're charging our credit card every day, it's impounded. And then, ultimately, how did they get around that? They had to send it over the internet, <laughs> bypass hard drives and customs, and how many days did it take? Days to send it across over there. But you could say, some would say these were obstacles, others would say it's all for the holy encounters. It's all for seeing with love. It's all for seeing that there are no problems and trusting. And imagine if you could do that not only with a movie, but if you could do that with your relationships, and if you could do that with your very identity, come zooming into the present moment and think, wow, I have everything right now. Actually, I have no problems right now. All problems are either remembered from the past, or anticipated in the future. And if you can really hear that, what you really hear is what I'm saying. The Spirit is giving us a, an invitation. It's the same invitation I received where I thought, I don't know about letting go of my future career, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, I'll provide for you. 
Everything that you need is right here in this moment. It's just this conditioning, this time conditioning that would tell us that we aren't everything right now. That we need something else to complete ourselves. Something of time to complete ourselves. And that's, to me, what all these encounters have been about. All these holy encounters that we seem to have all over the world is this gleeful, joyful, happy message that everything can be found in this moment. In fact, that's the last book that I, I wrote was this moment. There it is. This moment is your miracle. It's even the title. Of, they've asked me to write another book. I said, no. So maybe that's the last book that you'll ever get out of me. And the title of it is This Moment is Your Miracle. Tapping into the power of now, that Eckhart talks about. It's, you know, it, it can seem to the ego totally crazy, totally unrealistic, but actually the more we give ourselves over to that, that's where the peace comes in. Expansion of consciousness is only through love. The suffering, in, the suffering has to do something to affect this expansion of consciousness. That's the question. But going back in, 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 and 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 me when you spoke about the artist, and and, and as I see a, a creator, as an artist, as God a creator, creating. And having this creation, you know what you were speaking of that separation of this other entity of the art, and the art is looking at the art at that separation. There's a separation, you have to clear it. And um, no, I'm sorry, they, they still, uh, and, and there's also this delusion of separation, which I have come to, or I'm starting to come to the awakening of the delusion of the, that there is a delusion of separation. But still, I'm part of the delusion, and I cannot say that I'm free of completely of this delusion. Uh, so, there's no separation. So let's take a stand up. There's no separation. But then there is an intent of separation. And that's what perhaps Jesus or Buddha came here, and they are here, is to tell us there's no separation. It's just an intent. And they keep their life for us to have to break up this delusion. But this intent seems to be that may have been, or it is dangerous to the salvation of our soul. This is it's good. Getting back to the very first question you had was because I've studied so many religions and spiritualities and pathways and everything, and there's certain words that kind of get used, soul, is the soul eternal, is the soul on a journey, is the soul, uh, does it reincarnate, I mean, you know, there's a lot of things around soul. There's a lot of things around consciousness too, so you brought up that word consciousness, so let me right away tell you a bit what Jesus has to say about consciousness. He says that consciousness was the first split from heaven. And then he goes on to say, in case it's ambiguous, he says, Consciousness is the domain of the ego. Well, thank you very much, Jesus. Now we're starting to get, I'm glad to get this from the way, the truth, and the life, because I'm, I'm a spiritual reader and I read many things. So consciousness is the domain of the ego, and, and he explains that consciousness can be trained. Consciousness can be raised. Consciousness, remember the 60s? Raise your consciousness. That was the whole point of the 60s. That was the whole point of, of the, the concerts, of the, the encounter groups. Uh, that was the... Lovins. The lovings. The communities. Woodstock. That's a, the whole point of the 60s was right to raise consciousness. Raise. So con Jesus says, yes, consciousness is a matter of degrees. You can... It still has levels. It still has... Uh, compartments and you can raise your consciousness and 
reality, remember how I, I was saying earlier that you can't create your own reality. Why? Because God is the creator of reality. But reality is pure light. It doesn't, it's so high of a vibration, there, there is no density to it. It, it. It's not variations. Like in this world we have variations of light, sensitivity and light. Not, not reality. Reality is, is purely abstract. Even when I use the word abstract, there's no word in this world that relates to abstract. Because we may say, we go to an art gallery over Laguna Beach, and is it, is it Victorian or, no it's abstract art. But even that abstract art has what? Some colors and variations. It's not, maybe it's not so specific, it's more ethereal looking, but, but pure abstraction is divine light. That's what the Christ is, that's what God is, that's what oneness is, that's what eternity is. So it's beautiful because you're looking now at the question around consciousness, which in one sense we'll say consciousness is perception, because there's only one mind. So if that mind is asleep and dreaming of fragments, pieces, it's, that's what our perceptual world is. We're perceiving everyday life as a perceptual experience. So the way that that becomes purified is through forgiveness. Or the quantum physicists would say that when they discovered the quantum field, they were like, wow, it's all energy and it's all connected. And it doesn't even matter about time and space, superposition. It, it showed that it was all a mental, it was all a construct of the mind. And there's this um, connectivity that, that goes across distance. You know, when they can touch one molecule, and then a molecule that's light years away is, is, has the same movement, the same effect of touching one molecule, then it shows that time and space and distance are just illusions too. You know, they were, they, they call it entanglement. That's what the, the quantum physicists call it. I think that's kind of a funny word for connectedness, entanglement. I consider some of my relationships were entanglements. <laughs> At the time they were entangled, I wasn't exactly going, I'm so happy we're connected like this. You know, it was more of this darkness coming up with forgiveness. But what you're really getting at, I think, with in the moment, there, there is no observer and observed. There is no subject and object. That's what Maslow was really getting at. There is no means and ends. There is no gap. Everything is completely unified. Sounds very much like the quantum field. And in that, there is so much glee and joy because of the connectedness. There's no judgment there. You're not judging somebody as different from you. And if we even look at the second commandment, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, what I'm seeing is Jesus actually meant that literally, that your neighbor is yourself. That every time you judge anything, your neighbor or anything, you're laying that same judgment on yourself and, and you're holding yourself down in consciousness. You're holding yourself back from that light that we're going towards. So to me, I think, I equate the happy dream as a, just a dream of non-judgment. I see that the last characteristic of a teacher of God, out of ten characteristics, the last one to come in is open-mindedness. And what that means is you simply have no opinions. Is it possible to live a life with no opinions? whatsoever. That's my experience, you know, it's possible. Somebody can say whatever they want, do whatever they want. You're not there to be a judge at all. You're there to accept the truth of yourself and who they really are. And to me that's where the happiness comes in. Is there a, a, an expressive flow? I find yes. <laughs> If you look at Frances, she wasn't a movie maker, and yet we all clapped at the end because we were like, oh, how, how wonderful. But that was the, the flow of the Spirit. We hear it in music, 
We, we watch it some, in, in a dance. Sometimes we're watching a dance, or we're out there watching in nature and the leaves and the wind, like that uh, beginning of um, Forrest Gump, you know, that scene where you just, the camera follows that feather all the way around through the air, and then it lands right next to Forrest. And there's something about that opening scene in Forrest Gump that, I don't know, I, I think that's the best part of the movie. I'm just like, I'm going with that feather. I'm just, ooh, look at it. It's just dancing in the wind and going around. We don't even know where that feather is going. We don't even care. I don't care where that feather is going. I'm just with, merged with that feather. And that's what I think you're talking about. When we, when we get into the merge, there's so much joy, there's so much love, that there's not room for anything else because there really isn't anything else. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Yes. Thank you for being here. Um, a lot of my questions that I think that I'm gonna ask, you're answering as you speak. Um, but I'm just gonna be raw and honest, you know, from the heart. Um, the movie was very touching, and you know, I, I listened to you at night, your voice, your teachings, it puts me right to sleep, and I, I, I definitely um, can hear right now what you're saying and grasp it, and, and my intent is to vigilantly surrender my thoughts, my old beliefs, ideas to this correction in the course. However, there get, becomes so many times right now where, um, and then I'll start thinking, like, I don't want to make this about me, where the darkness is coming up. And I get very discouraged. I get very discouraged because I'm also very emotional. And I hear what you just, how you answered his question, and that's what I'm seeking is the peace of God to find that. Um, and... I believe that my relationships are my greatest teachers. I'd like to be able to have that blank slate and that through God open myself, you know, to be this change. But I feel like a bipolar mess. Um, stuff's coming up. I, I leave here yesterday, I'm crying, and, and it's not that I'm saying no, I just wanted to just be open and no private thoughts and vulnerable that maybe there'd be something that would come to either one of you that you could say. Because I'm hard on myself. And um, I'd like to be able, my intent is to get to that space where I can sit there. Maybe I put too much pressure to that. I want to be there right now. And I'm not there right now. <clears throat> so um, my question is, what is your, what are you guided to you know, answer on where I am? Is where I'm supposed to be. I'm trying to answer the question I'm answering. You, I, know, I just have a lot of emotions, emotions, and I think it's is it part of the process. It's like really interesting. It's happened quite a bit, where the practical application will be my life, just like you said. I feel that happen. Like my life, my daily life is the practical application, and then I feel like I made mistakes, and I'm so hard on myself, you know. And um, I don't know. That's just where I'm at. Um, so I'm just being honest, no private thoughts. And I want to thank you, and, and you too, too. Um, you know, and, and just everyone who's here, it's just been wonderful. And um, I hope to get to the space where I can be more neutral and allowing, but I'm very controlling. And um, right now the emotions are a bit much for me, so maybe I'll hopefully there'll be a retreat soon where I can go and have those sessions. And I guess that, I don't know if that made sense. But oh, yeah, This is just yeah. where I'm at. I'm grateful to be here, but definitely the things are coming up. And this is, I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You know, I, I just feel so much the calling of your heart. And, and you were wondering if this is part of the process. And initially, because so much has been pushed down and denied, that the Holy Spirit will have to, to teach through contrast um, because it's a way of starting to return to us the power of our mind and the power of decision. So it's almost like most all of us have lived lives of, 
of denial, of people pleasing, of covering things over, and that's been our pattern. And then we start to heal, we start to really pray and say, I really want to heal, I'm, gonna, I'm calling upon your help, Spirit. And, you know, bring it on, really, is the, is the prayer of our heart, is to bring it on. And then comes this very, very uncomfortable phase of, of starting to be aware of what was denied. Uh, because underneath all the darkness is the light, and we're calling on that light, almost like a, like a giant iceberg that's just forcing itself closer to our awareness, but it's popping like trees out of the way like they're little toothpicks, except we don't feel like they're toothpicks. Feels like somebody's got a chainsaw and they are in there and they are just, you know, they're, t they're cutting down the redwoods. Uh, it's like, what the hell? You're in Tamir Woods now. And, and then that's why you feel like sometimes like you can't function, like it's just too much because the redwoods are, are coming down if these are all the false beliefs. The thing that's underneath it is, is to remember how loved and how worthy that you are. That the ego, uh, Jesus says, Beware of the shabby ego belief that neither you or anyone else is worth constant effort. I like that line. Beware of the shabby ego belief that neither you or anyone else is worth constant effort. So, if you even take the parable of, of Francis and David, you know, I'm going around the world, Francis is in Sydney, she's got a meetup group of A Course in Miracles, 150 people, she's teaching it mainly conceptually, and Jason, you know, I think shows up at the back of your group and spends the last five or ten minutes just sharing something. And then, as with all of us, you came to a, a retreat, I think it was up in Noosa, she came up for a week retreat, and it was mind-blowing. Her heart just blew open, like, oh my God, there is so much available. And suddenly, after that experience, then she started to think, wow, this is such a powerful experience, and I'm worth it. That I'm going to go for this with everything, and I'm going to let go of anything else in my life that is blocking that. Now this letting go of anything else is not really a letting go of the way the ego teaches us, where we have to push things away, but it's more of an integration of, of including everyone else into our love, including everything into our mind, not pushing anything away, like with projection saying, well I'm glad I'm not like that, because as soon as we say, I'm glad I'm not like that, then we've separated already, we, we think we're other. But I really hear your heart, because I, I really hear you saying, I want this, but it's so intense, like I, the emotional, the emotional roller coaster ride of taking off the, the blinders is more intense than when I was asleep. <laughs> At least I was, somewhat consistently asleep, <laughs> but there was some relief seemingly in, this is like, remember the Matrix, you know, put me back in the, in the Matrix, I want to be an actor or something, okay Mr. Reagan, <laughs> you remember that scene with Cypher, like I don't even want to see where this is going. And I've actually had people who live with me or even work with me closely and they go down the rabbit hole but they go so far down the rabbit hole that it scares them of where the rabbit hole is going. It's the end. It's where, it's the, the merge, the great merge. And they will try to go back to the matrix and go back and get back in the old roles and, you know, because they just can't, they, they feel like it's just too big of a leap. That's not easy to do either. Once you've kind of jumped down the rabbit hole, you're in for an emotional, experience, because a lot of that unconscious darkness will come up. But the good news is that we have each other. That's, that's how we're here, through invitation. Miriam seeing the movie and going, wow, I want to share this with my friends. That simple 
sharing, or the times when we've come together, when, when Rita's brought you, said, come, come and look at this. We're, we're all going down deeper and deeper, and I always say to everybody that whoever I come in contact with, that we are on a lifelong relationship towards this awakening. And that this relationship and these relationships that we have are, are the most important thing in the world to us. We're not interested in anything in the world, the bigger, better, faster, more. Not interested. The, the ego trying to get the attention over here. We even have a friend of ours that, that said to Francis one time in a, a conference, I hope you make a million dollars with your movie at a Course in Miracles conference, and Francis was like, what? <laughs> like, because the goal is not to make money. The goal is not to have more of something or to accumulate something. The goal is here and now. It's present joy, it's present happiness. And admittedly, that's different than our programming. How many of us, you know, we're having breakfast with our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with our mom and dad, and their mom and dad are saying, forget about the future. Don't worry about your education. I don't care what you make of yourself. We have everything right now. <laughs> that would have been a cool thing to hear, but <laughs> we're hearing it now. And that this connection, this relationship that we have is so strong because it's got holiness underneath it. And so we would go through anything together with our mighty companions. I think that's what has happened in our life is, is we may call it a movie, we may call it a monastery, we may call it travel or whatever we call it, books, but you know, it's really none of that. It's a, it's a present relationship. It's this deep love and the connection that we feel, and we are in this together. And that's why we do. I get at least a call a week where somebody calls me up and they're going through the darkness. They're going through suicidal thoughts. They're going through, I can't handle this anymore. I, I'm reaching the end of my tolerance, my patience. And, and yet we join together deeply in prayer, on the phone sometimes, sometimes through a visit or whatever, and, and we come through it. We come back to that sanity where we can laugh together at it. And, and we will continue to do that. That's why we're here. You know, that's, we, we're here in Los Angeles. We're here just because of the invitation. Because the invitation is so strong. So just think of ourselves as mighty companions walking on this journey together. And, uh, and your daughter, I got to meet her last night. She's totally... You think of her. She's on fire. Think of her as as you include her in to everything that, that matters in your heart, it just strengthens it. She will reflect that back to you so strongly. She already, she already is. And I just want to just add a little bit because I feel like it's, it, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of emotion. Like anybody who are on an authentic spiritual path would say it is a very emotional path. You cannot just meditate it. You cannot just understand the metaphysics and, and then transcend the whole belief system. It is a very emotional path because everything that is blocking us from the truth is going to come up to be, to be faced. And like David said, relationship is the fastest way because we, can't, we have nowhere to hide. When we're in a relationship, it's so close. The mirror is strong and everything is, is coming up. And that's why this movie didn't really show a lot of concepts, didn't show the course actually means this, not that. This is the metaphysics, that's not the metaphysics. It actually shows the relationships um, that people are on and the emotional journey that they're on because it is such an intense undoing. And yet, once they set the prayer up, they're done. It is it's done. The, then they're on this auto autopilot journey. They have no control of anymore. So Soren wanted to be transparent. That's his prayer. Then everything unfolded. 
for him to open up. And Frances Romero, she was an amazing cook. She was an amazing cook, and yet she wanted to. Her prayer at the beginning, I didn't put it in the movie because it was very long. She wanted to let go of her self-concept of being a good cook. That's her initial prayer for these thirty days. And Jeffrey's prayer was wanting to learn trust. So everybody just said a prayer for the end goal, and then boom! It seems like things are all falling apart to the ego's judgment. The ego is judging things. Everything is falling apart. But it's the self as we know it is falling apart. So it feels like I just yeah just want to encourage anybody that that feels the emotion is rising up and they are losing control. Then just let it come and and that means the spirit has got it. <laughs> Most intense things is when the intense emotions hit. There can be a tendency to, to feel very、um, alone, and and there's a part in the course where Jesus says, "You will not go on alone from here. Mighty companions go with you." I had a woman recently who started just texting me and texting me and and started to have some mystical experiences, and she was just like. I'm going through such an awakening right now, but nobody around me can understand it. That、uh, that they're they're trying to commit me. I'm <laughs> the most glorious experiences of my life, but when I try to verbalize these experiences, they want to commit me. They want to lock me up. And so we communicated for a while, and then she finally I said, "Well, I'm going to be in Camas for a while." She, she said, "I'm four hours away. Could I come there?" So she came down. She met with me, and the more we just joined, I just listened to what was going on in her mind.、Uh, it was like three different people came to mind that are going through like parallel, have, are going through or have gone through parallel experiences to what she's going through now. I was like, ah, three mighty companions. So as soon as she drove down to meet me. I I called one up on the phone and I called two more up on on Skype, and she took down all their she she chatted with them. They felt an immediate connection because there were so many parallel experiences going on in their lives. And then they said, "Let's stay in contact." So that I think is also what the prayer is underneath the intense emotions. Is there's a in a sense of I need. Relevant reflections of help and support, and I and I, and I need them to help me stabilize and help give me the faith to keep going. And I think that's a part of what we do. There's no accidents in any of these gatherings. Is that it's the spirit is behind it all, bringing the mighty companions, the ones that we can really relate to, and the ones that that, that are with us.、Uh, Like your your daughter is, feels like she's very joined. You have those that are sent to you that are the, a very strong symbol of this constant、um, support and care that's close by. And the prayer is to let that continue. You know, that's that sense of intimate companionship along the way where you can you can start to laugh together at things when they came up instead of the. The old witnesses, which were more like doubt thoughts, like Francis said, even making her movie, you had your share of doubt thoughts that came and that reflected back that that had to. She had to be very clear of her purpose, and at times she had to let go of certain ways that the movie was going to stay in that vibrancy of that purpose. So that's our prayer for you: is that you. Have that real, constant, relevant sense of companionship. That you're not alone when those in, intense emotions come up. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's the fast two hours. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This is my joy. Very thrilled to be here with you, and and thank you for.
for sharing all your comments of the movie. Well, we will carry those in our heart as we head on down towards San Diego and another uh, similar showing where we have time to be with each other, be close to one another and, and go through this together and then actually go through the experience of the movie together and then have a follow-up the next day. So that's, that's how we're doing it right now. We love you all. We, we thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.